Well, welcome. And today's guest is Myrna Phillips, former MLA for Wolseley in the Winnipeg area. That was from 1981 to 1988. And she was only the second woman in the history of Manitoba to rise to the position of Speaker of the House. Hello. Hello, Leslie. First, would you tell us a bit about your constituency? Ah, Wolseley. Um, it's a, a lovely tree neighborhood in uh, uh, near downtown Winnipeg in the West End. Uh, lots of uh, old houses, uh, uh, a very mixed neighborhood. It's got uh, people of all socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, uh, very different et ethnic backgrounds, uh, a lot of uh, single parents and uh, a lot of very progressive people. Uh, uh, it's referred to as the Granola Belt, and uh, um, we're very proud of, uh, of that label. Of course, it's a very urban constituency nonetheless, but you were a country girl, a farm girl, I think, and you've lived in many parts of Manitoba which have informed your view of this place. Tell us a bit about where you have lived in Manitoba. Well, I grew up in Roland, um, so, uh, South Central uh, Manitoba, on a farm, and uh, lived there until I finished high school. Um, I lived in Brandon for 12 years when I uh, was married, and uh, then moved to Thompson, and I lived there for three years. And uh, because of the uh, job that I had uh, with an adult education program, I got to travel all over the north to 10 different communities every month uh, before I moved down to Winnipeg. So I think I have a pretty good uh, understanding of uh, you know, people from all different areas of our province. Well now you are known and you still are as a, a, a feisty champion or activist if you like for women's rights in particular. And I, if I understand correctly, wherever you traveled, you saw the, the same kind of, of problems that were faced by, by women um, in, let's say, the, what, 60s, 70s, 80s. And I'm wondering what the issues were that actually propelled you into politics. I guess what propelled me into politics was uh, when, I, when I grew up, uh, uh, my family wasn't uh, active in party politics. But uh, um, my grandmother, for instance, who lived across the garden from me, uh, always talked about uh, going around uh, southern Manitoba with Nellie McClung uh, to get the uh, votes for women. And uh, when Nellie McClung lived in Manitou, and uh, um, I remember uh, my father bringing his friends home and sitting around the kitchen table talking about the issues of the day. So I was always aware of, of uh, uh, you know, political issues, but uh, when I came to Winnipeg, I went to United College, and I went to, uh, uh, a friend said, oh, come with me, I'm going to the CCF club. And uh, when I um, uh, went and I listened to the speaker, uh, it, uh, it rang true to me with uh, the uh, United Church philosophy that I've been brought up with, you know, um, uh, you know, you're your brother's keeper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, the first uh, political activism I had was uh, stuffing envelopes when I was uh, uh, 18 years old for Stanley Knowles, and we couldn't even vote until we were 21. Um, so. Uh, um, when I uh, when I was living in Brandon, uh, I was involved with uh, my party there and worked in uh, several elections, uh, federal and provincial. Just uh, during the election time, I, I wasn't that involved during uh, in between. But um, uh, as I got involved in the women's movement in Brandon. Uh, we started to see that a lot of the things that needed to be changed uh, had, had the only way to do it was to have legislation changed. So uh, I became more interested in, uh, in um, what was happening on a provincial mm -hmm. level 
and which issues uh, could be affected. Well, what kind of groups did you did you work with? Um, I'm presuming you were involved with community groups trying to solve specific problems? Well, at, at, the, at that time, um, I was uh, president of our community club, Park Community Club in Brandon, and um, I, um, uh, my neighbor gave me uh, one day The Feminine Mystique to read, and uh, I started reading it and uh, I stayed up all night until I finished it and the next day after I got everybody out the door to school and work I ran next door and said you know this is uh, uh, this is what we've been looking for this is a problem without a name why why we're uh, feeling dissatisfied that there ought to be more to our lives and uh, so she and I and uh, uh, eventually a uh, bunch of other women got together and we ended up forming the Brandon branch of the Manitoba Action Committee and we started studying issues like family law and the need for child care and, uh, and um, the situation of reproductive health and uh, so all these issues uh, um, then uh, uh, we had to sit and think about well, if we want to change things, how do we go about doing that? And this group of women were uh, a nonpartisan group. We were from all different parties, but uh, um, there was a lot of work being done federally with the Royal Commission on the Status of Women. And uh, uh, so we were taking our knowledge of those issues and the things that needed to be changed um, into our respective parties. So. I was part of a group in my party that uh, uh, fought to, at conventions, to get uh, policy, uh, party policy changed and then hopefully, uh, because of that, get the government to move on these issues. Now, you started to get active in, let's say, the late 50s and you weren't actually a candidate until many years after that. Why didn't you see yourself as a, as a candidate? Well, again, in those days, I mean, you know, uh, women uh, um, uh, made the, cooked the turkey for the fundraising banquets and took the pies and the cakes and, and uh, you know, that was our role in, in the party at the time. And, you know, the men did the, uh, uh, the election planning and the men were the ones that ran as candidate. We never had a woman elected in our party until 1981, and uh, so, you know, we did the door knocking, we uh, distributed flyers, we did all those kind of things, and stayed home and looked after the kids, of course, while the men got involved, and uh, so it wasn't until um, uh, the early 70s uh, that the women in our party, and I don't know about others, but we decided after uh, uh, 1977, when the Shire government was defeated, uh, that we were going to look at women actually running because at that time we thought uh, we were pretty tired of trying to convince the elected members uh, to act on women's issues that maybe it might be just easier to do it ourselves. So uh, we were looking for women for uh, uh, winnable ridings because heretofore they had women running in ridings that uh, they needed a candidate but no hope of ever getting elected so we decided that that was a place to start and uh, we put all these uh, uh, resolutions forward at conventions and had them passed so we had the party policy so we wanted to make sure that the party policy got turned into legislation and one of the ways we decided to do it was to have women run for uh, nominations in winnable ridings. So tell us about your nomination. Was that an easy access into <laughs> politics? To just walk in and sign up? No, 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 no. It wasn't easy at all. It, uh, uh, in fact, it was even harder than the general election uh, when it was called. Um, uh, I, I had always considered myself to be a backroom person. I'd been on election planning committees. I'd uh, um, been the president of my constituency. Uh, 
um, I, I organized for election day. Um, so I hadn't considered myself as a candidate. Um, I, I uh, did, wasn't a lawyer. I didn't. I was a single parent. I didn't have any money. I didn't. Uh, uh, I, you know, didn't have a university education and political science or anything like that. So I was uh, always saying, well, you know, there's got to be really good women to run in these. Uh, uh, in, in these constituencies and when the women in our women's group said, well, Myrna, why don't you run in Wolseley? I said, oh, no, no, not me. You know, I'll, I'll help whoever we can find to run. But uh, um, after seriously thinking about it and I had some really good support um, uh, from uh, uh, the constituency executive, from uh, the president of my union, because of course, you know, we have in, on paper political rights as civil servants, but I was a government employee, so that was a concern. And uh, so I decided to run. Well, um, there were two uh, men that decided also to run in Wolseley. So we had a three month uh, campaign for the nomination. And uh, it was, a, I, I was working full time and uh, going out in the evening uh, signing up members or talking to existing members to get their support. So it was a very, very difficult. It sounds almost impossible for you to do all of that without a huge, without a cadre of supporters. Who helped you throughout well, that? that? That was the beauty of it was uh, uh, because I was a single parent and, you know, I wasn't a wealthy person who could uh, afford to hire a nanny or anything like that. Um, I had a whole group of uh, women and some men who uh, uh, volunteered to do all kinds of things. I mean, I had people doing uh, the job of uh, uh, organizing uh, the appointments for me to go visit people. But I also had a wonderful group of women who, uh, uh, some being civil servants too at the time, didn't want to be publicly out um, working against the present government. Uh, but they came, uh, they took a turn every one night every week to uh, come and uh, provide child care, so I was free to go. I had uh, women who I would give a grocery list to who would go and do the shopping. Women would uh, uh, do the cooking, they would make casseroles and things. So when I dashed home from work and had to feed my daughter and myself, um, you know, there was uh, food in the house. and. Uh, and they, I, I couldn't have done it without them. It was amazing. And I don't know whether anybody before or since has had such marvelous support. And what about that moment when suddenly you accepted the fact that you were in fact a member of the Legislative Assembly? <laughs> what then? Well, I woke up the next morning and I was sitting at my kitchen table. And of course, I was used to getting up and catching the bus and going downtown to work. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table and I'm saying, now what? You know, there's uh, there's no manual for how to be an MLA. It's uh, everybody has to develop their own uh, uh, their own uh, uh, modus operandi, as it were. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, well, do I sit here and wait for the phone to ring for constituents to call with problems, or like, what do you do? <laughs> so yeah, you had you had to just start from scratch, but. You know, almost every job I've had in the past, um, I jumped into the deep end and, and uh, had to figure out, uh, you know, how to keep my head above water. And uh, so that's what I did. So your strategy was then uh, to get into the legislature and make that policy law, as it were. And tell me, what what did you actually help to accomplish for the women of Manitoba? Do you have a list? You must have a list somewhere. One of the first uh, things that happened was the Premier appointed me as Legislative Assistant to the Minister of Community Services with uh, the um, uh, duty of preparing uh, new child care legislation. So I worked with the department with the child care office uh, to develop the legislation 
Then we went, uh, once we had that through, we went around uh, the province and held hearings in all over the province to get feedback on the regulations. So uh, this was really groundbreaking legislation and uh, it's still in force today. So it dealt with, uh, with uh, um, quality programming, uh, it dealt with staff qualifications, the, the physical environment for daycare centers to bring them all up to a, a certain standard uh, because early childhood education is so important. I had to continue through the rest of my time at the legislature fighting to get the dollars uh, to expand uh, child care and they're, they're doing that to this very day. They're carrying on with that as a foundation and, uh, and just adding spaces and, uh, and more centers uh, to try to meet the needs of working parents. So that was one of the main things. The, uh, uh, there were two other uh, issues on our platform. Uh, one was uh, family law, which had actually been brought in uh, it, uh, prior to 77, but um, uh, had uh, um, some setbacks, and uh, so we had to work on uh, restoring you know, that to 50-50 of both uh, family assets and commercial assets. And uh, the other major issue was the pension legislation that uh, Mary Beth Dolan, the uh, then Minister of Labour, brought in. And um, this was an absolute uh, groundbreaking uh, major um, change to uh, pensions that are under provincial jurisdiction. Uh, we uh, made it mandatory that any pension in uh, Manitoba had to be, uh, our pension payout had to be calculated uh, with um, unisex, a single actuarial table. Before they used to have one for men and one for women, so if a man and a woman contributed equally, the equal uh, number of years, because their table said that men lived longer, they got more per month than the woman did. So uh, we, uh, uh, you know, concluded that, you know, that was not fair. Changed that so that they got equal uh, monthly benefits. Uh, we also changed it so part-time women were covered. So if a company had a pension plan uh, and uh, women were, mostly women were working part-time in the retail area, that um, uh, if they work, say, half-time, they contributed uh, half the pension premium uh, than what than to what a full time person would be contributing, so they were covered uh, in in uh, in the same um, amount as they they participated in the in the labor force. Um, we also uh, made a change when it came to survivors' benefits. Some uh, companies' pensions had no survivor benefits. So I, I, um, when I worked at the Women's Bureau, I met a woman whose husband had died at 62. She'd raised five children, sent them to university, never worked outside the home. And when he passed away, there was no survivor benefit for her. She, she was entitled to $58.69. And uh, of course, if she was like 58 or nine, how could she possibly live on that? So we made sure that if there was a, a pension plan and there was a, a, a benefit to the actual employee, that their spouse would uh, get a survivor's benefit of at least two thirds of what that employee would have got had he lived to, to retire. So these two issues, the family law, and the pension issue had to this day, I think, the most profound impact on women's economic situation in the province of Manitoba. So in terms of economic terms, both for women working and having their own pensions and, and uh, women who are in relationships, uh, they're much better off economically. And of course, with the childcare, 
they at least have an opportunity to be able to go out and be economically independent. What was your reaction to the idea of being Speaker of the House? Because that is an incredibly intimidating, high-profile situation. Probably not what you signed up for. No, I'd, I'd never expected to uh, the Premier to ask me to be Speaker, no. Uh, you toy with the idea that maybe one day you'll be in Cabinet and, uh, um, you know, I, uh, my first four years as a backbencher, I, I looked at my colleagues who had to answer all these tough questions in question period and I thought, oh my goodness, do I want to, you know, take something like that on. But during that time I was uh, uh, elected chair of our caucus, so I, you know, chaired the caucus meeting uh, every day when we were in session and, and uh, less often when we were not in session. Um, and I'd had some experience uh, both in uh, the labour movement in my own union and the MFL chairing and, and within the party um, chairing conventions. So I, you know, and, and also in my union I had uh, uh, run workshops on parliamentary procedure to help other women get involved in, in their union and, uh, and in the party. And uh, so I had some knowledge of parliamentary procedure, but Robert's rules are much different than Beauchene in the, in the legislature. And uh, um, in, in uh, those other settings, you don't have an opposition that's um, uh, trying to uh, use the rules to get around uh, whatever the government's doing. So, yeah, it, when the Premier uh, asked me if I would be Speaker, of course, you say whatever I can do to help the cause. But, uh, you know, you say that as you're shaking in your shoes, so <laughs> you, you do it. And uh, so I had three weeks from the date of the election until the House opened uh, for the throne speech and uh, for me to be elected as Speaker. And um, so I, uh, I, the clerk of the House spent uh, three hours every day with me going over the rules. And, and also because we'd gone through the French language issue uh, my first four years, um, I uh, hired a tutor and she came in and uh, we spent uh, time every day going over the uh, uh, title of the bills that I had to introduce uh, in both official languages. I thought, uh, I'm not going through all that uh, uh, bell ringing without uh, accomplishing something. What was it about the, the role of Speaker of the House that was most challenging, most intimidating, like when, when you had nightmares about it? What kind of nightmares were they? Well, usually what happens is the Premier nominates someone. In my day, they've changed it now. But the Premier would nominate someone and the leader of the opposition would second that nomination. Well, in my case, the leader of the opposition uh, stated publicly that I was too, quote unquote, strident. Uh, in other words, uh, might uh, not be um, um, neutral enough to uh, hold that position. So the uh, leader of the third party, who was uh, 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 Senator Sharon Carstairs now, but uh, also a woman, uh, agreed to second my nomination. So because I didn't have the support right off the bat of the opposition, um, it, it made my life rather difficult. The, the first day I thought was a trial by fire. And I thought, okay, once I've proved that uh, uh, I know what I'm doing and that they, uh, uh, they can see that I know how to handle all these different procedural issues, then they'll back off. But uh, uh, I was speaker for two and a half years and uh, they never backed off. Well, would you encourage young women in particular to consider a political career now? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I, I do. I, uh, we've got a lot more women in the, in the provincial legislature now, and I'm very supportive of them. And uh, um, I think that from being in caucus with just five women members, uh, to be in a caucus where you had half 
women members would be wonderful. I think to this day, there's still women's issues are still low on the priority list. And um, you know, if you want anything done, whether it's something in your community or uh, you know your neighborhood, uh, um, a lot of the things that uh, people need to have uh, uh, moved to. Uh, make their lives and their neighborhood better are only done through politics, through the legislature or city council or their school board. Um, and uh, to get things changed, you have to be there. You have to have a voice. And, uh, you know, we are 51% uh, of the population, but um, we're not represented in those numbers in any of our political environments, whether federal or provincial, and uh, I would certainly encourage young women to get involved. I think, uh, uh, you know, regardless of what, what's said in the media, it's a very honorable profession. You can, uh, all the people that I worked with in the legislature were there because they believed that they could make a difference. And they weren't there just to sit and collect their pension or get perks like, I mean, we never had any perks in my day. But, um, we never even got a pension, but uh, um, uh, they were there because they were dedicated to changing uh, the province for the better. And uh, what better place to do it?